Thank you, Hampton Library. Thank all of you watching. Uh, thank you, Ms. Marton. Caddy, if I may. Absolutely. Good. Let me begin with what I wrote for the East Hampton Star. Caddy Marton is ideally suited to explore what she calls the remarkable odyssey of Angela Merkel in a deft and sympathetic biography, The Chancellor. Uh, like Merkel, uh, Kati spent her earliest years under communism, Hungary in her case, later observed German politics and politicians as an NPR and ABC News correspondent, then returned as wife of America's ambassador there, the late Richard Holbrook. As many of you know, she was previously married to the late ABC News anchor Peter Jennings. Uh, she's the author of nine books, including True Believers, Stalin's Last American Spy, and Enemies of the People, My Family's Journey to America, a Book Critics Circle Award finalist about Hungary's miserable mistreatment of her prize-winning journalist parents. After Wells College in Aurora, New York, uh, Morton studied at the Sorbonne and the Institut d'études politiques in Paris, raised a Roman Catholic, she learned much later and by accident, that her grandparents were Jews killed at Auschwitz. Former chairwoman of the Committee to Protect Journalists and of the International Women's Health Coalition, Martin is also a director of the International Rescue Committee, uh, Human Rights Watch, and the New America Foundation. A longtime Southampton resident, she recently moved a bit east to Sag Harbor. And now to the subject at hand. This biography of Angela Merkel is a wonderful window on that very special figure in a very fraught period that continues to concern us all. In fact, we must note that in the ongoing Ukraine crisis, the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline from Russia, with which Merkel was so closely associated, has become a dangerous double-edged sword designed to help meet Germany's energy needs after Merkel's green-minded reduction in reliance on nuclear power, but also increasing Moscow's leverage on Germany, uh, Europe more broadly, and beyond. But we'll get to that in due course. Uh, Kati, I'd like to begin by asking how well you knew Merkel from your time in Germany before beginning the book uh, as a journalist, later as wife of our ambassador, and your early impressions of her. Well, first of all, David, let me just um, thank the uh, Hampton Library uh, for its wisdom in, in choosing a biography of this astonishing woman um, airing, I believe, on International Women's Day. And I cannot think of a more appropriate selection because she is uh, indeed um, a role model for all of us. She, she uh, is, is definitely my role model for, for uh, I, I have no political aspirations, you can relax about that, but, uh, but in pursuing her, and it, this was uh, a five-year project, I, um, I have come to um, so respect her. Let me just jump in and say this is not a hagiography, I hope you agree, I deal with her blind spots, but she is so remarkable and has so many lessons for men and women and particularly for people who are interested in, in how to gain and keep power. Um, I, I sometimes, in the course of the five years that I was working on this book, I felt like I was writing um, chapter two of Machiavelli's The Prince, calling it The Princess, because she is such a shrewd politician. And I bet that most of our extremely intelligent um, uh, Hampton uh, uh, viewers of this um, would not immediately identify her as a, as a cunning, canny, and at times ruthless politician, which she absolutely is, as, as I make clear in the book. Was that all obvious to you when you first came upon her as a absolutely correspondent? Not. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely not. Absolutely not. No, because she doesn't want you me anybody to know that I, I this is this is uh, not a, um, a, a scandal filled uh, version of her life because there are no real scandals in her life but it is a um, it, it, it captures how she benefited from always being underestimated by foolish men, sorry, they were mostly men, uh, because the German political class is a male uh, culture, and, and how she 
took advantage of that very fact, the fact that just because she has a rather plain uh, exterior and isn't flashy, doesn't you know bang on the table, um, is a pretty poor speaker, we have to admit, um, so no, no firebrand, um, she sneaks up on people. And uh, they, they say in Berlin that the, that the graveyard behind the parliament, the Bundestag, is littered with her, with her victims, victims of her political jujitsu, because she outsmarts all of them by being extremely um, secretive and shielding her ambition and holding her cards very close uh, to the chest. And there's so many lessons, I don't know where to start, um, in, in her life story. What okay. kind of help, uh, encouragement, or discouragement did you get from Merkel as chancellor, a most private public figure and not given to writing uh, journals, letters, even memos, much less talking for publication? Um, this is not a book she wanted written. Um, this is uh, much too revealing of the private Merkel. I frankly was not interested in the machinations of, of German politicians and, and the complex uh, um, coalition governments. I mean, really, you mentioned the word Bundestag and people's eyes start glazing over. So this, w what I was interested in was, was how she achieved this. She, a triple outsider, so from the East, she grew up in East Germany, uh, a scientist and a woman. I already alluded to the fact that, that she, she made it uh, to the very top of a male pyramid. So who uh, is this woman? And the specific event that really triggered my interest was 2015 when she alone in the West and certainly alone in Europe opened Germany's borders to one million non-white, non-Christian refugees, refugees from many of the wars that we had a role in starting, so Afghanistan, Iraq, and particularly Syria. One million, her, her friend and sometime mentor, Henry Kissinger said, Angela, to, to allow one as to, uh, to allow a single refugee uh, sanctuary is a humanitarian act. One million is to destroy Germany. Well, it was a, a moral decision as well as a political decision on her part. So I want to go back uh, to, uh, I think, the key decision uh, mm. by Merkel's clergyman father to move his family from West Germany mm. to East Germany when so many were trying to go in the opposite direction. Uh, talk about the kind of man and minister her dad was, yeah. uh, how he saw his mission, how he handled it under mm. uh, tough communist regulations, and, mm. and how it affected his daughter. Well, um, the, 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 the two pillars of, uh, of who she is uh, are, one, her upbringing as the pastor's daughter, uh, a very stern, austere Lutheran pastor uh, whose full approval she never gained. Can you imagine her parents never voted for her? Um, and second, um, the East German um, regime. So those were the, the, the two um, basic influencers in, in the foundation of, of who she became and explain a great deal about why she's so private. Because in the Stasi state, in the East German um, police state, um, you, you couldn't trust anybody. In fact, she later found out that her lab partner who she befriended and trusted was informing on her. So no wonder then that she has a circle or had, she recently left the chancellery, and boy, do we miss her. Um, uh, I, I refer to Ukraine. I hope we get to Ukraine. Yes, yes. Um, the, the, um, her circle um, of confidants is, is tiny. I, the, my, one of my great challenges was to penetrate that circle, which I did. Um, and when, when Obama went to say goodbye uh, to his friend, uh, his, his closest uh, head of state friend, uh, Angela Merkel, he looked around. Um, her staff had come um, into her office to, for this occasion. He looked around and said, you guys still all here? Because it was the same team that was there eight years before, and we know what a revolving door the White House is. And not only was it the same team, but not a single tell-all biography or memoir has ever 
come out of um, come come out of her her chancellery, which really speaks to how uh, um, how inspiring a leader she is, and uh, and how much her 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 team uh, how devoted they are to her, which is which is one of her superpowers. But uh, though she didn't want the book written mm. to begin with, mm -hmm. she didn't get in your way. I mean, she no. she gave a green light to, I, to yeah. people to talk to you. I, I think I benefited from two things. One, um, I had sent her my memoir, Enemies of the People, which uh, she claims to have read. And, and, and so there was, I wasn't just another American uh, author snooping around um, the chancellery. Um, and, uh, and yes, the fact that I'm a woman, she really, unlike Margaret Thatcher, she really likes women. She, she has surrounded herself with powerful women. Um, you, you, you can tell right away, you know, with, uh, she's, she has, she gives very powerful eye signals because she's, of course, afraid to ever say anything uh, in, the, in the age of social media. Yeah. By the way, she doesn't practice social media for that reason. But she gives off that signal of, yes, sisterhood. I, I mean, I felt that. So that was an advantage. And also, she liked uh, Richard, my late husband. And so I think I maybe a little bit benefited from that, although they, they got off to a kind of a fractious uh, start, too. Oh. We've mentioned uh, morality and power. Mm -hmm. uh, you write that she developed her own very personal vision of religion uh, mm -hmm. that had to do with morality and power. Uh, talk about more about what yeah. that vision was and how it helped guide her to and in uh, public service, inevitably politics. Yeah. Well, she believes that faith is, uh, is a private matter. She doesn't believe in, in um, you know, parading her, her Lutheran faith. She's not, um, her, her, her faith is really about a, a moral code, uh, a sense that, uh, that we who are privileged uh, have a responsibility to, toward those who are less privileged. Hence, um, during the, the, the greatest humanitarian crisis since World War II, the, the, the refugee crisis of 2015, um, she didn't hesitate. She, she said, wir schaffen das, which in German means we can handle this, you know, just a flat assertion. And she proved her friend Kissinger absolutely wrong. She proved all the naysayers wrong because uh, I spend a lot of time in, in, uh, in Berlin, in Germany, and it's not even a topic any longer. Refugees, they have been uh, assimilated uh, for the most part. They're always, you know, uh, bad actors, but... Um, it's, 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 she's done it. She, she leaves a transformed country is the truth of it. A, a now a, an, an open multi-ethnic country that is, um, not only Europe's, uh, in, 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 in does, uh, economic and financial hub, but its moral center, which when you think about this being just two generations from, from the Holocaust and, and Hitler is quite a remarkable uh, transformation. So that, that, um, that is another reason why I think people should read this book, that it's possible to stick to your uh, principles and not go down electorally, because she was reelected four times. And, and uh, in, 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 in today's world, that's pretty astonishing. And, and re-elected without pandering, without you know, selling her soul to, uh, to get elected. It's, it's a remarkable achievement. Uh, I was fascinated that as a child, she seems to have been both very shy mm -hmm. and a natural leader. Uh, so yes. tell us a little bit yeah. about the, what childhood. the people who knew her then yeah. uh, reacted to this sort of yeah. contradictory nature. That was the most uh, enjoyable part of my oh, research good. was going back to her yeah. her home in in uh, Brandenburg province in in the eastern part of the country and and finding her childhood friends and and teachers and she was always the brightest kid in every class so she could have chosen any field the reason she chose science in the in the um, east in the communist system was because science is a little tougher to manipulate by the state than almost any other field but of course once the wall fell. Um, she took off her white lab coat and went looking for uh, for a political party that that suited her needs and and her interests. So so science was just a good place to park her her, her brain. But she was um, uh, always a, a rather tomboyish, rather androgynous uh, uh, 
uh, creature, not not uh, you know for a politician, very very little personal vanity. Um, when she first uh, w jumped into uh, po uh, the political realm, she was shocked at how much attention was paid to her appearance. Um, and so she, she, the, the way she dealt with that, typical pragmatic Merkel way, was she got a um, closet full of a woman's equivalent of a man's uh, dark blue suit. So she has uh, a, um, a wardrobe of, of jewel-toned jackets, black pants, and, and black flats. I once saw her shop for shoes in, in a um, department store in, in Berlin, and while her security team pretended that they weren't there, you know, melting again because she hates having, uh, having security, um, she bought six pairs of identical black flats. So this is not a woman who cares a great deal uh, about uh, staying uh, um, in fashion, but but she always she always looks good, and, and her concession to to all this um, attention to her appearance was that she she um, she in preparation for her first meeting with George W. Bush, she got highlights, and uh, and she so she was so pleased with the result. I interviewed her hairdresser <laughs> <laughs> as a good reporter that she has continued to. Uh, to get highlights twice, however often that happens. But her consciousness of attire came through even early uh, as she became more familiar with the West, even in the clothes she wore as a kid. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, a she signet. got called in. Yes. Because she, she wore? Blue jeans. Yes, she, she, got, uh, she had an aunt living in Hamburg in the western uh, part of Germany, and, and she got you know, the symbol of, of, uh, of, of capitalism in East German eyes. The, uh, blue jeans. I, 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 I actually had a similar encounter when I was a kid in, in, in Budapest because I used to get hand-me-downs from American uh, diplomatic kids and got called into the headmaster's office. I have to say to her credit, she, you, you, quote, you have a great quote of hers about why she chose science because she said communism wasn't capable of suspending mathematics and the rules of nature. Right. which meant that they couldn't no. interfere with that line of study nearly as much. Uh, talk about her university days in Leipzig, from the Club of the Unkissed uh, to a PhD and a new last name. Yes. Well, um, it, it, this isn't really, doesn't work so well in English, but, but the CDU was uh, are the initials of the Club of the Unkissed, which, which, which is also the party that, that she chose, which is why the Germans made something of that. But she didn't stay unkissed for too long. She married early. Um, she claims that, uh, that she married mostly because you could get an apartment if you were married. It was not the, but she kept uh, the name Merkel. Um, and uh, the only, uh, like everybody else in her circle, uh, her ex-husband and her current husband never give interviews about her. Her family, her siblings, her parents have never given a single interview about her. Can you imagine? The, which added to the challenge of my job. But he did, Mr. Mr. Merkel, her ex, did come out of his silence, <clears throat> did break his silence when um, when she did this spectacular, um, bold and, and, and humanitarian act of allowing those refugees in, he, he, he said, um, well, that's the first time she's done anything really uh, honorable. And, uh, and that was the end of that. But, but she, um, yeah, the, the Stasi uh, uh, tried to get, get dirt on her um, and her, um, her love life. And she, and she had a pretty, pretty active love life uh, b um, between husbands um, and um, has a marriage that, um, that is very important and sustaining for her now, now going on uh, 30 years. Chose not to have children, however. She, she, uh, I know, I know, you know, it's one of the first questions that, that, that women particularly ask me. Did she have to, was that a sacrifice for her? And uh, I think because she's so pragmatic, she just decided that politics and, and, um, and raising a child were incompatible, and she doesn't do anything by halves. 
Um, so she she foreclosed uh, that option. But but she's a pretty good um, stepmother and step grandmother. But he, David, here's the thing: how private she is. As her biographer, I am asked by Germans, does the chancellor have grandchildren? I mean, that's the, that's the level at which she has controlled information. The answer is yes, she does. And you can only imagine if she were an American politician that we'd all be familiar with her grandchildren and their, know them by their first name. Not to mention her cats and dogs. and Yes, all of that. All of no, that. She, doesn't, she doesn't play that game. No one has ever seen the, the, in, the interior of her apartment, which, by, by the way, is the same apartment she has lived in for 30 years, rent controlled. And even in this age of Zoom calls where we can see you know, what people have on their bookshelves uh, and their art, nothing behind it. I've, I've looked at her Zoom calls and there's a blank wall. So for her, her, her privacy and, and her, uh, her, her need for a separate life, a separate persona outside of politics has been crucial and I think explains a great deal of how she has uh, uh, sustained 16 crushing years of really just going from one crisis to the next because she does have this other place where she goes, where she can read, where, where she, she loves nature, where she goes on, on, on long rambles in the woods, which her staff calls her, the chancellor's think tank, the woods. And, and you know, she didn't exhaust herself and she didn't exhaust her, her, her fellow Germans with her looming presence, quite simply, as I say in my book, because she doesn't loom. She lets, she lets people go home, her staff, for example, and live their lives, and she goes home and lives hers. Yet another lesson for politicians. Don't be in our face 24-7. We'll, we're, we're not going to want you around for 16 years if, if you're, you know, always big brothering us. You write about how uncomfortable she was growing up under communism, but there was a, a real important motivation and a, a, a model of what could be done uh, besides getting away from it, uh, from a trip to Poland in 1981, a very crucial time politically. Yes, yes. So, um, well, let's, let's talk for a minute about when the wall came down. She, um, it, was her, it was her first time that she, she went from, from um, East Berlin to West Berlin. And of course she was dazzled, but, but, but Merkel is never blown away by, by events, you know, not by, not by wars, not by crises, not by the financial meltdown, not by Donald Trump, not by Putin. Um, she just has, she's as centered as an oak tree. Um, and and the, again, uh, what a, what a, what a gift to the German people to have such a centered individual um, as, as their leader all these years, through all these crises. And so here, here's this, you know, the tectonic sh uh, uh, plates of history were shifting in 1989 with the wall coming down. Typical Merkel, she, she crosses into the West, spends one raucous night, uh, you know, uh, toasting freedom and meeting West Germans and being dazzled. Next day, she, she's back at work and she has a... Um, in East Germany. In, yes, it's still East Germany. And, and she had a, um, a, an academic conference in Poland and, and, um, and she keeps, keeps her schedule. Um, you know, people are people in Poland are, are telling her that uh, that you know the Polish uh, communism is over, that the Germany is going to be unified. Uh, she just, I think, the important thing to 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 uh, take away from from uh, um, this this trip to Poland is that um, she's she's un unshakable, and this is what drove not only Putin crazy, but Trump crazy, and, and all the others, Orban and Bel Bolsonaro and, and, and um, Erdogan, you know, that she just, she, she sorry, this is gonna sound anti-male, but <laughs> she, she has really made a study of macho men. And she thinks that, that um, narcissism is a, um, is a waste of time and that women cannot indulge in. 
and therefore, um, sh when when, for example, um, a Putin who who was forever trying to shake her uh, confidence uh, unleashes his dog, um, knowing that she's afraid of dogs having having been bitten, she just freezes. She pretends that she doesn't notice when when Donald Trump throws candy at her and says, don't say I never gave you anything, Angela, uh, at, a, at a G7 meeting. Everybody else is horrified. She ignores it because, of course, you know, the, that's how you treat a bully is, is you don't take the bait. It seems like such a simple lesson, but I, I never encountered another politician who was so able to resist you know, get, meeting, meeting a bully where he wants to be met, which is at his level, so right. a charge with a counter charge. So it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's this great self-discipline that she mastered as a citizen of a prison state. It's more than a little ironic that a key factor in uh, Chancellor Cole's ultimately choosing Merkel for his cabinet uh, was the place from which she so desperately wanted to escape. Uh, talk about the politics uh, and why he felt he needed an East German, uh, the politics of the decision uh, to okay. put her in the cab, to, to raise her to that Yes. Height. Well, okay, so now we're going to go uh, back to her origins, which, which are fascinating, um, and her, po her political origins. Um, and, and again, uh, everything that I've said about, about how her, her capacity for, for self-control and ruthlessness where necessary played out in this chapter where, where she was um, the, the um, chosen um, minister uh, for, for women, youth, and then env and environment, not because of her uh, stellar resume, but because she was a woman and she was, she was um, from the East and Helmut Kohl, the, the man who unified uh, or is credited with unifying East and West Germany, needed such a person on his, in his cabinet. And what does she do to repay him for that? She ends his career. Why? Not because she, out of malice, but because he, he let he let her down and he let the country down by taking kickbacks from donors whose names he refused to divulge. Merkel, who is not a sentimental creature, and you know, another stereotype of women shattered, um, wrote an op-ed which everybody in Germany read saying, essentially, the king is dead. Uh, it's time to leave the stage, Helmut. And that was the end of, 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 of Helmut Kohl. And it was the beginning of her ascent. Um, so she did, she killed two birds with one stone. And uh, he never forgave her. But, uh, but it, that, that bold move so impressed the rest of uh, the party that there was never any question after that, that the, 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 the chancellor's job was hers. And, and let me just emphasize that she is the first woman chancellor in a country that never even had a queen, I think, virtually unique in Europe. Uh, he never quite forgave her, but you said there was an eventual reconciliation and what you called his double-edged greetings on yes. her 60th birthday. Mm -hmm. Double-edged in what way? Well, he, in, in his birthday greeting, he said, uh, congratulations, dear Angela. Uh, you, you certainly can't look back uh, uh, and, and feel that you've ever missed an opportunity. Uh, in other words, you're a killer. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so now we get to her remarkable record. First woman, first East German to be chancellor, fourth term, 16 consecutive years. She brought the country further than ever from the shadows and the shame of Nazi rule to new moral high ground and international clout, but not without some blowback. Uh, talk first about the EU financial salvation that she championed uh, for Europe's less productive, less parsimonious yeah, uh, in, yeah. uh, in the global financial mm -hmm. crisis of 2008. Even four years later, there were protests when she visited Athens. So uh, talk about that, the yeah. politics of that. Well, 
yeah, this this was not her finest hour. The the financial meltdown of 2008 uh, presented her with a tr tremendous challenge because, of course, the EU is 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 a nation with unequal uh, uh, economically developed countries, and she chose austerity uh, for the countries that were that were deeply impacted, and and really she ignored. Um, the, the, the human factor here. Um, because she's such a hyper-rational person, she often, I fault her, that's one of the things that I fault her for, is that she, she uh, underestimates the role of the irrational uh, in people's behavior. And, and to her, it was obvious that, the, that countries like Greece had been living above their means and had been cooking their books. And, but that wasn't necessarily the fault of the Greek citizens. It was their government and the banks. And um, so the Greek, uh, Greek population uh, really had it in for her, burnt her in effigy, et cetera. But in fact, her, her austerity plan for Greece eventually, uh, until COVID hit, uh, really got Greece uh, on the right track. And, and she's, she's she now, I just came from Portugal, another country that, um, that where she imposed the same uh, strict measures. And, and she is now uh, fondly remembered. Uh, but this was an early mistake of, of not presenting a more sympathetic uh, face. But at the end of her term, in contrast to this, uh, she's the one who pushed through uh, a, a COVID uh, rescue package for those countries that were hardest hit by by uh, the, um, by COVID, and and um, in opposite, she she was opposed by the rich northern nations, but she insisted that this be a collective rescue. So not, so so not a loan to these countries, right. but an outright grant. So so you know she's a she's a work in progress. I would say she 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 because she. Ego is not a problem for her. She doesn't mind being wrong. She learns from her mistakes. But there was a political price in Germany for the bailout, uh, notably on the far right, which has become well, part of her legacy. Well, most definitely, the Alternative für Deutschland, the AfD, is a child of the Merkel era. And it's a result of, of uh, they, first, they first emerged uh, during the financial uh, crisis uh, as anti-EU, and then they found a much more emotionally uh, fruitful cause with refugees, um, because um, East Germany never went through the process of um, assimilating the lessons of, of Germany's darkest history. East Germans had 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 uh, bought into this myth that they were the good Germans. The Nazis were all in the West. Well. Mm, not exactly factual. Um, so, um, so they don't have the same feeling of a debt to um, debt to the world that the West Germans have, and debt particularly to to um, to Jews, which which Merkel has identified as Germany's permanent uh, reason for existing. In fact, she 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 um, gave a speech in the in the uh, Israeli Knesset saying that that you are part of our foundational um, values. Um, and uh, because the East didn't go through that, they did not welcome refugees because they, they don't feel like they have to atone for anything. And, and as a result, that is where the far right is nesting. And 20% of East Germans voted for the IFD. But I'm happy to tell you that the that the um, that the party itself is losing steam, and um, it's it's now in the single digits, and I would I will make a prediction that Germany will be the last European country to go populist to fall for populism because it's done such a thorough job of confronting its darkest history in a way that we in the United States are are now forced to do ourselves. Germany has done that. Germany has done that, but not so much in the East. Uh, we've mentioned COVID. She moved quickly when COVID uh, first struck Germany mm -hmm. uh, as a scientist. 
but before she left office, she had to admit it was worse than anything we've seen. What happened or didn't happen? How much blame does she bear? Um, she handled COVID probably um, as well as any head of state. It's a it's a um, a, a phenomenon that that even uh, science hasn't been able to uh, master because it, it because it keeps it's a shape shifting virus, um, and um, and. Germans, uh, particularly again, East Germans, have had a hard time um, with uh, with the vaccine and with the masking mandates and so on. But I th I think she handled it um, as well as any and better than than most. And she was uh, she was horrified that the United States, a country that she reveres, um, she had photographs of, of Reagan and uh, and Bush the elder in her office. Um, that um, that under Trump we we seem to have kind of lost our our uh, our axis our center and that was that was a painful passage for her those those four years um, particularly the last two um, where um, uh, where she where she saw that the United States was was not quite the country that, uh, not quite the society that had been her North Star. Well, let's take a look at current events now. We mm. have to look at Nordstrom too. this gas mm. pipeline from Russia to Germany, a pawn in the Ukraine standoff. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about Merkel's goal and role in getting it built, uh, the doubts, the opposition yeah. she had to overcome. You called it a blind spot in her record. Uh, should she be blamed for giving Putin too much leverage? Um, her handling of Putin was genius, and boy, do we miss it now. I would say that the reason that Putin is now um, aggressing into Ukraine is because he's testing the post-Merkel European Union and the will of the West um, under Biden. I, I connect these two issues because you notice he hasn't met face-to-face with heads of state, the way he he he's pretty much outsourced it um, to his foreign minister, um, the way he used to meet for endless hours with Merkel. Those two speak each other's languages, literally, um, and and understand each other. There's uh, theirs is her longest uh, dysfunctional marriage, uh, thirty plus years. They are products of the same system, the communist system. And they have a perfect understanding of each other. So when he first moved in to Ukraine in 2014, uh, she was all over that. She, she spent so many hours negotiating with him. And because he has great respect for her, the only head of state that he respects, um, he's, he's stuck to the talks. And so she said that at times um, when she was negotiating uh, the Minsk Accords, which froze the initial conflict, um, she didn't know what the only way she knew the time of day was whether they were serving bread and jam or a <laughs> roast. So who who does that today? That kind of sustained, uh, uh, stubborn, we're not leaving until we get a deal here. Nobody's doing that. And I, I fear for us now, and I, I, I really, I really, I know that, that, that Germans are being, um, and the new German chancellor, I, I pray that he's calling uh, his predecessor often. Uh, I'm sure he is, but not, not that either Merkel or Olaf Scholz, the new chancellor, would tell us that. But, but um, her, she really kept Putin under control for 16 years. Well, but, you know, it didn't prevent him from seizing or retaking Crimea. It didn't prevent him from sending uh, no. reinforcements into uh, no. the, in no. the areas she's, of Ukraine. She's not a magician. Um, uh, Russia is not going away. She knows that. Um, when, when Obama handed off um, Russia to her, because Obama was so exasperated by Putin. He said, that man just lies to me. And she said, well, he lies to me too. But, uh, but Germany is next door to Russia and has to deal with Russia. And therefore, um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to give up on Russia. And you know, she, her, her brand of, 
of uh, negotiation is, is based on her mastery of the minutia of the facts on the ground. So she would go into a meeting with Putin armed with, with um, you know, precise intelligence on where his militia went the night before so that he couldn't blow smoke at her. He, and and she, she just held his feet to the fire and it worked. And I just hope that, um, that someone on our team <laughs> uh, is, is devoted enough to the cause. You know, in, in part, it's because, yes, she's brilliant. She has a photographic memory. But also, she has remarkable stamina. You know, um, she, she says she's like a camel. She's able to, to store sleep and, and go for days without, and then she collapses. And that's what, you know, you, 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 you need that, that kind of stamina. I observed uh, my husband, Richard Holbrook, negotiating the, the end to the war in, the, in, uh, in Bosnia. And it was the same kind of, we're not leaving here until we have a deal. But Richard used bluster and great charm and uh, you know he did have a strategic sense but she doesn't use bluster she doesn't use um, threats just this very quiet <laughs> um, and uh, sustained and stubborn I see where you went last night your your guys so don't tell me that that you're not advancing because I have aerial photographs right here and she had them right there so that's, it's, it's a kind of um, negotiation that, that requires more than, uh, you know, parachuting in for a long dinner. It requires staying there, staying at the table. And, and that's, uh, that, was, that was Merkel's way. All right, I want to start looking ahead. Uh, for her formal farewell ceremony as chancellor in December, uh, Merkel requested a Christian hymn an East German punk hit that I won't take a stab yes. at pronouncing. You, you forgot the color film, it's a called. <laughs> and a song with the wish, let me encounter new <laughs> wonders, let me unfold anew from the old. Yeah. After that, she didn't make an appearance until a week ago at a federal convention that reelected the German president, a mostly ceremonial position. Uh, but it was Merkel who got the uh, initial round of applause. So uh, I want to know what you think her life is going to be going forward from that apartment okay. that no okay. top officials or colleagues even <laughs> were invited to. She turned down, we, we understand, an offer to head a, a UN advisory. No, she's not going to take any jobs. No, she's done. No. I mean, after you've been Chancellor of Germany for 16 years, there's no job. Will there be will... any public service or humanitarian yes. Yes. efforts, do you think? Yes, yes. After a, she's free for the first time in her life. Uh, 35 years under, under the Stasi, 16 years as chancellor. She's, she's uh, savoring her freedom. Um, she, there are many things that she really genuinely uh, loves to do. She's not one of those politicians who only exists. So some of them are what? Uh, hiking, um, long walks, long swims in, in the lake uh, near her very modest little country place. Um, and, um, and books, uh, big reader and music and, and opera. And, you know, she's, she hasn't seen much of her husband really for, for, uh, 16 years. So, um, however, with her scientists eyes, she is observing, she will observe, uh, her own reaction to the sudden freedom, uh, you know, no schedules for the day, nobody hovering around her. Um, and she will observe and, and, and uh, see her own reaction to it. And if she perceives that, that she misses a seat at the table with the powerful, she will have ample opportunity to do that. And, and the two areas where I, I suspect we will be hearing from her are her unfinished, uh, the unfinished business of climate change, because, because her entire 16 years was a rolling crisis. She was just about to get to climate change as her final act when COVID hit. So I think we will be hearing from her on climate and also on women. And the fact that, that there are countries in the world where women are really still struggling 
um, particularly in Africa, I think she's going to be focusing on, on that. I have that on, on pretty good authority. So, um, you know, she's relatively young. Um, she's in pretty good health. And uh, so I, I, I think for the, uh, for the benefit of all of us, I, uh, I, I don't think we've seen the end of her. But, but she's such an elegant um, a person, she would not reign on her successor's parade. She, there was no, uh, I, maybe I should stay on, maybe I, you know, she left at her own chosen speed. In her, in her leave taking, she, she provided a final lesson on how democracy should work. And the irony that it's a German chancellor that's showing us how a democracy should work it should not escape anyone. Have you heard about her reactions to your book as she begins writing one of her own? And what are you most hoping to learn from the book that she's going to write? She's not going to write a book. Ah. She's not going to write a book. Uh, that is not in her wheelhouse. Uh, she's not a writer. She's not a, um, she doesn't enjoy um, ruminating about herself and might have been. If she, if she writes anything, which I would doubt, um, it'll be about a specific issue. But, uh, but no, she's not, she's not one for self, uh, self-examination. And uh, I, I, would, I wish she would, but, uh, but I don't think we can. Um, as for my book, um, I think she would find my book probably too, uh, too personal. Intrusive. Yes, too intrusive. I wasn't interested um, in, in uh, the mechanics of German politics. Is there anyone who is? Um, <laughs> I, there must be three or four people. Uh, I was interested in, this is a character study. This is, this is, this is a portrait of an, of an uh, phenomenal uh, historic figure. And now she really has entered history. She is no longer a politician. She's a historic figure. Kenny Martin, thank you so much. Thanks also to the Hampton Library and to all of you out there watching.